The average person on the street thinks of power as being their congressman or something along those lines. But over the certainly over the course of the past two years, we have seen, no, no, there are directives coming from the World Health Organization and international bodies like this that seem to have a lot more weight than the average person would have thought in the past. And who is pulling their strings and how does that work? Again, I don't think it's it comes down to a single identifiable group of individuals, but I think there certainly are organizations that do have uh, the ability to wield international agendas. And you don't have to take my word for that. You can take the word of someone who is intimately involved with that. For example, David Rothkopf, who was Henry Kissinger's mini-me. He ran Kissinger's, uh, Kissinger and Associates. He, uh, I know he was writing for foreignpolicy.com. I'm not sure what he's doing these days, hopefully retiring. But um, he came out about a decade and a half ago with a book called Superclass, which I talk about often. I don't necessarily recommend as a wonderful read or anything of that sort, but it is at least an admission in the words of one of the conspirators, that there is a conspiracy. He just calls it a super class. 6,000 or so individuals who are beyond and above any polit national political office who are able to wield power and uh, influence agendas transnationally. This super class can do things that average politicians can't. Well, excuse me, what? I, I thought, you know, we represented, we, we pulled a lever once every four years and that was the sum total of power in our, our society. Of course, it doesn't function like that, but that is the narrative that's given to the uh, the plebs, essentially, um, because there is an elitist philosophy, which I often go back to, I talk about at great length, the ideology of eugenics, in which the ruling class genuinely believes that they are the ruling class because they are genetically fit, they are genetically built to be the ruling class, and we us lowly plebs scrabbling to eke out some sort of existence from the economy that they give to us are genetically poor enough that, uh, you know, you're in the position you are because you're just not up to our standards, our wonderful standards. I mean, look at the David Rockefellers and Henry Kissingers of the world. They're, they're, sheer, they're obviously supermen compared to us, right, Buck? So yeah. um, it, it, can, it continues to go back to that philosophy, which I, I think gets to the heart of it. I don't think that eugenics... Um, even the pseudoscience of eugenics is necessarily important in its particulars, but I think it reflects the sort of the ruling class mentality, which has always been there. It's just in different eras, it takes on different forms. And hundreds of years ago, it was the divine right to rule. Oh, we rule over you because God has appointed our family to rule over you. That doesn't quite fly in our modern enlightened scientific era. So they came up with a modern enlightened scientific justification for the exact same thing. Oh, well, it isn't God that's appointed us to rule over you. It's genetics. Our genes make us better than you. And I think once we start to wrap our mind around the ideology of eugenics and the pathology of psychopathy, we start to get an understanding of the types of people who are in the real positions of power, not the political positions that are essentially the shadows on Plato's cave wall. Mm -hmm.